And joining us now, the Hyundai Texans Radio Studio Executive Vice President and General Manager Nick Casario. Nick, how's it going? Jens, good to be here. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the victory, and it really was special to see the Texans come out so strong against the Steelers, a day where J.J. Watt goes in the ring of honor and a 30-point output. What were your impressions of the day, Nick? Yeah, it was probably a good day for everybody involved. I think the most important thing is we played good football. So anytime you play good football, there's kind of a trickle-down effect. Uh, I think the halftime ceremony, really the whole weekend for JJ, um, you know, is well deserved. Um, there's a lot, and hopefully he was happy with the result and happy with the outcome. Um, from a team standpoint, I think the big thing is we were able to get off to a fast start, so we we're able to take the ball, go down the field, and score, which we haven't done uh, over the first three games. So got off to a good start, <laughs> gained a little bit of momentum. Uh, you know, played well defensively. You know, in the first half, you know, we're up 13 nothing, and then we're able to execute there at the end of the first half, kick the field goal up 16 nothing. So against a good Pittsburgh team, so I think being able to get off and a good start, uh, off to a good start, was key to the game. Uh, it was good atmosphere. I uh, you know the Steelers had a lot of fans, but there was a lot of Texans fans in the uh, in the stadium as well. So um, overall, I think we're pleased with the performance. Um, celebrated on Monday, and time to move on to, and get ready for Atlanta, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Nick. Nico Collins has been – he's been really good this year. There's no doubt. I want to go back, if you don't mind, to his draft evaluation because he doesn't play in 2020. The whole COVID thing with the Big Ten was all jacked up, and by that point when he had already decided, I'm out. So he doesn't play in 2020. <clears throat> he does go to the Senior Bowl for a few days, for a week. What did you see in Nico back then, and how much trust did you have to kind of put in what you saw before COVID because you obviously didn't see him during COVID? Yeah, no, it's a great point. So I'd say – the player evaluation sometimes is going to be specific to the individual player, and you really can't control the circumstances. The only you can control are the things that you see on tape. Um, as you alluded to, he had a good season there um, the, the prior to the COVID yeah. year. So you saw th some things from a size. Um, he was athletic for his size. When he showed up to the senior bowl, candidly, he was probably a little bit heavy, a little bit overweight. Um, so I think from the time he was drafted until now, um, he's put in a lot of very diligent work, kind of reshaped his body. He's in good condition. He's strong. The things that we've asked him to improve, he's improved. Probably where he's made the biggest jump is just the run after catch. I think a lot of that is the way that Bobby and the offensive staff coach um, running with the ball after the catch. There's certain techniques that are involved, and I think he's embraced that. I mean, you're talking about a guy who's 6'4", 215, 220 pounds. Sometimes it's a confidence thing, like just play to your size, play with conviction. Don't kind of pitter your feet catch a ball and get vertical and make it hard for the defense to tackle you. Um, and I think you're starting to see the fruits of some of that labor that Nico uh, has put in. But going back to the evaluation, you try not to put too much stock in whether it's just the senior bowl. If you go based off of that, it could um, skew your evaluation. I want I'm, it's not the same. I'm not saying they're the same players, but this was similar to Gronkowski when he came out, yeah. you know, Rob basically missed a year yeah. of football so you have to go off of the information you have from the previous year, whatever it is, and then put it all together and then just make a determination, a decision about how you feel about the player. Nick, I know there are a lot of answers to this question, but to what do you attribute the play of the offensive line last couple of weeks, no sacks, all the adjustments you've had to make, how do you see it? Yeah, I'd say work ethic and coaching. So I think when the players put the work in on a day-to-day -day basis, um, they take a lot of pride in what they're doing. Um, you know, frankly, they probably have heard the noise or negativity so maybe surrounding their place. So I think that at times there's a certain pride element that's involved as mm -hmm. well. And you have a challenge on the other side of the ball that we were facing relative to Highsmith and TJ, who are arguably two of the best edge rushers in the league. And I think what Coach Strausser and Cole have done with that group, and I think just staying kind of consistent. And I think we've adopted the mantra and mindset. D'Amico and I have talked quite a bit about this just figure it out and make it work because that's the NFL. So we're not going to make excuses. Whoever is available to us, try to make the best decision, put the players on the field that are available to us, and go out there and try to play good football and just have confidence in your teammate, have confidence in one another, have confidence in your training, and then go out there um, and try to perform to the best of your ability because that's all any of us can ask of any of our players. Nick, the rookie class has, has performed very, very well. I think a guy that gets lost in it a little bit is Dylan Horton. 
But when he's on the field, he's been making plays. What did you see in him coming out of TCU? And what have you seen in the growth of him the last few weeks in particular? Yeah, typically take eight or nine defensive linemen to the game. They're all going to play. They're all going to be on the field. Um, Dylan missed a, a pocket of training camp there. He was out for a few days. I think what you're seeing, and D'Amico has talked about this with players, you're just seeing improvement. So is the player improving from where they started to where they are now? Um, Dylan played a lot of good football at TCU. I think he sort of reshaped and modified his body. There was a lot of weight fluctuations yep. when he was at TCU. He was asked to do certain things. I think he's embraced the techniques and he's embraced the fundamentals um, and the coaching that you know we've asked of him. Um, so each week he gets incrementally better. I think the play on the Y screen there the other day was a very aware, instinctive play. Um, you know, it could have been a big play, but something that we rep, we worked during the course of the week. We knew this was a screen team. It's, you know, to be able to make that play, to be able to kind of see the formation, see the adjustment, see how it was being blocked and then react, you know, certainly a big play in a game. And I think one of the things that you've seen from the defensive line, it's all with rank, it's all with Dylan at different points, is their ability to run out of the stack, turn and run which goes back to the mindset and the swarm mentality that we've kind of built into the defense that D'Amico believes in strongly. I asked Coach about this, about the Bama backers, right? You have Christian Harris and you have Henry, and those guys are like brothers. They're siblings, if you will, uh, making tackles, making stops. And Johnny was raving about Henry stopping the back of the end zone on Pickens. Can you talk about that stuff? Yeah, I mean, specific to that play is a very instinctive play. Um, we were in a coverage where they created a matchup, you know, where the receiver was going to be on the linebacker. Um, you know, Henry got himself in good position, um, kind of played through the hands there and, and finished the play. I yep. think, you know, D'Amico talks a lot about finishing, and that was really a great example of that because Pickens actually had his hands on the ball. Henry kind of continued to play, and then when he hit the ground, the ball popped out. But um, we've seen this from spring to training camp. Henry's a very instinctive player, um, kind of had an understanding of what they were going to do on that play, and he went out there and made a play. But I think those two players have certainly improved. Christian certainly made improvements, even going back to last season. He was out the first four or five games, so he was injured. Um, you know, and there was a little bit up and down with him, but I think he's made some incremental progress as well. And you know, we've talked about this from week one to week four. You just want to see, hopefully, improvement in your team, both individually and collectively. And you're starting to see that across positions and specific to those two players that you just mentioned. Nick, you've been around a lot of teams uh, throughout your career, a lot of different iterations of Patriots teams, different iterations of Texans teams. So it's kind of a strange question in some sense, but what does confidence do for a team? Because it feels like the team that we saw on Sunday was playing with a lot of confidence coming off that win against Jacksonville. And I would imagine having a lot more confidence coming out of this win uh, against Pittsburgh. What can confidence do for a team? But also there's that fine line of confidence can't turn into cockiness as well. Yeah, I think the reality is it's about mindset and it's about belief. So do you believe in what is in front of us? Do you believe you can go out there and win? That's a big part of it. So it's about what's your mindset, and then during the course of the week, are you doing the things that are conducive to winning? So and when, the, when you go out there and you see sort of the fruits of your labor manifest themselves in the result, then I think that builds – confidence just collectively as a group if we do the right things if we go out there and play the way we're supposed to play then it's going to lead to hopefully good results so we played that game uh, specifically against Pittsburgh the right way we didn't turn the ball over we had to advance we talked about this at the in the pregame about yep. having the advantage in the running game yep. we had the advantage in the running game didn't turn the ball over played better in a red area and so as a result you know we yep. you know won the football game so I think it's just Belief has never wavered, but I think when you see it manifest itself in positive results, the players understand go, what's going on. The players are aware of what's happening on the field. They believe in each other. They have a lot of confidence in each other when they're on the field. Uh, sometimes the ball is going to bounce the way that you want it to bounce, but it's about the work that you do during the course of the week and are you prepared to go out there and play a good football game against a good football team. Don't really necessarily get worry. Well, don't worry about what the result is going to be. Focus on the process that's going to lead to those results. And if you do the right things and you have a chance, if you don't, then you're probably going to make it a little more difficult on you to win the football game. You mentioned running the football better. We talk about this every week, but again, another big step forward in the running game. And what was going through your mind when Devin Singletary is rolling to the right and, oh, my goodness, he's going to throw it. Yeah, we, we practiced that play a few times during the course of the week, <laughs> frankly. And I think a couple of guys have mentioned it didn't look great. <laughs> um, but – 
it goes back to what we just talked about, just having confidence that you trust your teammate, you trust that he's going to do the right thing, you trust that Devin's going to make the right decision, that drive, the way it was set, set up. I and mean, we, we shoot some time off the clock, um, and Bobby felt confident in the call. He made the call, and it was just two football players making a football play. So, I mean, Motor's a good football player. Motor's been a good football player as long as he's been in the league. He's been a good football player since he walked in the building. We have a lot of confidence with Motor's on the field. Um, and Motor had confidence in Dalton that he was going to make the catch, and we had confidence that Motor was going to make the right decision because if they take it to play it well, play away, then you're just going to go have to keep the ball, and he'll run it out or just you know make a right to make a, make a good decision. Throw so, it out of bounds. Or that's, that's or tough to do for or, a running back, right? <laughs> well, it's just split second decision. Yeah. So you have to see where's the defense. You know, Peterson kind of. You know, he took a step forward, so there was a little bit of space. Fitzpatrick was late coming over, so he was actually able to put it in position when there was a little bit of space, so it was a well-executed play. When you give a guy that doesn't throw the ball the opportunity to throw the ball, he's throwing that <laughs> sucker. He's throwing it. There, yeah. There's no doubt he's throwing yeah. that And then he's going to be asking for the next time he's yeah. going to be yeah. able to throw exactly. the ball. So that's there, there's no question. Okay, this one's behind us. Let's move forward. Sunday, go to the, uh, Atlanta, take on the Falcons. It's an NFC team, so it's not one we see a lot, but – D'Amico brought up a great point. He faced them last year when he was with San Francisco, so that does help. But let's dive into it. Bijan, Pitts, London, a lot of great athletes offensively. A.J. Terrell, Gray Jarrett. Let's get in the scouting report, Nick, of the Falcons. Yeah, a good football team. You know, they're kind of the inverse of the Texans this year. So they started 2-0, and lost the last two. We lost the first two and won the last two. So um, good football team. They have a lot of young, explosive players. Um, Arthur um, has done a good job. Um, and Terry, they've done a good job of kind of putting together a good football team. I kind of made the change last year, I want to say week 12, 13, whatever it was, when they inserted Desmond into the lineup of quarterback. Um, offensively, they have a lot of, I would say, hybrid, very versatile players. Um, you know, Bijan, Bijan is, is, is a really good football player, does a lot of things. He can run, he can catch, he's explosive. He and Tyler are a good complement to one another. I mean, Tyler uh, he ran for 1,000 yards last year, so the good one-two mm. punch. CP's on his way back. CP didn't play the first three games. CP's got a really unique sort of background, but a lot of hybrid players. Pitts is a tight end, but he's really a receiver. Drake's a big receiver. He can do a lot of different things. They have a good offensive line. So they've played well at, moment, at times. Um, the, the games that they've struggled, they've turned the ball over. So it goes back to the correlation between taking care of the football and winning and losing. Um, and defensively, I'd say a little bit different than Pittsburgh relative to where the problems lie. I'd say Anyamata and, uh, and Grady Jarrett present a lot of problems inside. They have good edge rushers, but Jarrett and Anyamata um, are involved in a lot of the negative plays. Um, Anderson just went on IR, the kid they took from Montana State yeah. uh, um, you know, a couple years ago. Um, but they brought over some players that have experience in the New Orleans sort of system or defense. Um, so Ellis, you know, Anyamata had played yep. for Coach Nielsen. Yep. Um, so defensively, it's kind of Coach Nielsen. Jerry Gray is involved. But good front. And then you mentioned the secondary. A.J. Terrell is probably one of the better corners in the league. He's gotten continually better. He shadowed Ridley there the other day. They yep. signed Bates, um, who's one of the best free safeties, one of the best safeties, who creates a lot of negative plays. So they made a, a lot of uh, – they committed a lot of resources in the offseason defensively. Um, and they, I think they've given up, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 points a game. You know, they're playing good on defense. Right. They tax you. The pro coverage is really it's, – it's man, but it's not. It's all match. So they make it hard on the offense, and they make you execute plays. And then offensively, they have players that are capable of making explosive plays and are pretty solid in the kicking game. So you mentioned it. You, you, this is a team – the AFC – excuse me, the NFC South – only see him once every four right. years, and then we're going to see him the next you know four weeks in a row. Yep. Yeah. D'Amico and Bobby have kind of have experience playing them a little bit, so you kind of go back to that. But it's a good young team with a lot of good players. Um, you have to play the right way in order to have success against yep. them on Sunday. Nick, zooming out, they played in London. They're going to play the next week. Didn't want the bye. Some teams like the bye. Some teams don't like the bye following an international trip. At some point, the Texans will do this again. But what are your thoughts on that in general and how to handle those things? Yeah, he, he it's, can go either way. Mm -hmm. So we've been a part of teams where we've done it both ways, where you've practiced the whole week, go out there on Friday, you know, have a normal Saturday, play the game Sunday, and come back. Also gone out there a few days ahead of time. So it's really more on the back end coming back. Monday – there's a little bit more of a Monday off mindset and mentality in the league. So 
losing Monday, I wouldn't say is necessarily a big deal. And then Tuesday's the off day. Then you're kind of into a normal Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for your preparation. So just logistically, you have to figure out what makes the most sense. Do you have the bye week on the other end of it or do you not? So um, it's about being flexible and mm-hmm. kind of adapting to the circumstances. But regardless of you know what Atlanta went through, they'll be ready to go um, when we go down there on Sunday. Nick, I know that Desmond had some struggles against Jacksonville through a pick six. That was tough. But what have you seen overall from Desmond from the time he got in the league until now? What kind of growth have you seen from Desmond? Yeah, Ray? he's done a good job. I mean, if you take the Jacksonville game out of it, he's he's really made sound decision, a good decision with the football. He's taking care of the football. He's athletic. I wouldn't necessarily call him a running quarterback, but he's athletic for the position. Um, he can make some plays um, off schedule. But Desmond had a lot of experience. I mean, he's a four-year starter, which you don't really see that much in college right. football. Won a lot of football games. I would say that program was de- uh, built and developed over time, what Coach Fickle did. Um, so, and then when he had an opportunity to play there at the end of the last season, you know, he played well. So he's had his moments here this season um, as well. So, I'd say Jacksonville, you know, their game was a result of turnovers. So, yeah. two interceptions, lost fumble. Then that translated into, you know, them ended up unfortunately losing the game from their perspective. But Good young player, has some good athletic attributes, typically makes good decisions with the football and can make some plays with his feet. Nick, you've had some guys hurt, some guys coming back, and they continue to come back. How hard are some of these decisions you have to make with the roster, and how much has it helped over the last decade to have the flexibility of expanded practice squad, IR flexibility, and all of that? Yeah, Mark, it's really, I think it's it's benefited everybody. It benefits the players. Um, and then from a team standpoint, you just have to sort of take the information and just kind of build a strategy accordingly. So I think what you're trying to figure out the most are those players in the shorter term duration that two to four week window all right you sometimes have to make a call maybe you say look we're just going to put them aside for four weeks that might be the best thing for the player and then after four weeks bring them back or could they come back if it's really they can come back maybe week two week three then you have a decision but otherwise this is where if you can build the depth of your team you feel comfortable with the players that you might have to use you understand you're going to have to utilize everybody at some point but the most important thing is the health of the players. So giving them the best opportunity to get themselves mentally and physically prepared for football, you know, that's a big part of it. And then whenever the practice clock, uh, practice clock starts, mm-hmm. then they got to get back into sort of football shape and football condition. So we'll kind of take it one day at a time. We'll see how practice goes this week, and then we'll make a decision, you know, when it's appropriate about when those players are available. A scale of 1 to 10, how envious are you that the Falcons got to play in Andy's room and the Texans have not gotten to play in Andy's room? Toy Story. I don't even yeah, know I if he knows I, what I was, what, I was going to ask that because I wanted to see his that's reaction. That's way over my head. Yeah. Oh, so you, know, you know the movie Toy Story. You know the movie Vaguely, Toy Story. Yes. Okay. Don't ask me about movies. We've talked yeah. about that. No, no, no. So. Wait, well, I, I know. I, 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 know, I missed they, that one. It was pretty awesome how they how they did it. They took the they basically took all the geo tracking and everything and turned them into Toy Story figures and played the game from Atlanta to Jacksonville. I'll a, stick to normal football. Along those lines, though, now that we're You're on good. the subject, give us a show or two that you liked when you were a little kid. Oh, yeah. Growing up, you watched this because you liked it what was it transformers okay, or something no, actually, like that I, I, I'm, I'm probably gonna embarrass myself but that's okay no, that's um, okay we embarrass uh, ourselves uh, on a daily basis uh i actually was a saved by the bell uh, oh fan. here saved we go hell yes yes so i'd say that was one you have now gone um, on my rankings ricky schroeder silver spoons mm-hmm. so yeah, those are a couple one. i'd say sort of that i may have watched yeah, uh, yeah from yeah. time to time so yeah, there you go yeah <laughs> And that, I, I can't believe you just said "Say by the Bell." You are, you're, like you're high in my rankings, but you, just, I mean, you just went up. That's huge. That's one of my. I just said that to Josh the other day. It was like "Say by Be- Say by the Bell" was one of my favorites growing up. Zach Morris. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Screech. Okay, Nick. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Thanks, guys.